All right, everybody. Well, welcome to our Wednesday ongoing coaching meeting. So glad that you're here. We're actually concluding a series we've been in today where we have been having some outside voices come in and challenge us and encourage us, and it has been awesome. So if you've missed any of the past six weeks or so, most of them are on YouTube. Uh, they're all on Slack as well. Some of them, I think there was uh, a little bit of security uh, sensitivity on some of them, and we have those in Slack if they didn't make it to YouTube. So uh, definitely uh, check them out there. But we have a special guest with us today, and I am so excited <laughs> about this special guest. Uh, Dr. David Garrison and I, we've, uh, David, I think we've been on some calls together. We've emailed back and forth, but I hope one day we get to hang out even more. But uh, he's really been a huge influence in my life through his writings and for many of us through his writings. So I'm going to do a little intro of, of Dr. Garrison and let him share. But Dr. David Garrison and his wife, Sonia, have more than 30 years of experience working among the world's least reached people groups in China, India, Southeast Asia, Egypt, Libya, and Tunisia. Uh, Dr. Garrison has a PhD from the University of Chicago in the field of historical theology with a focus on missions. He's the author and editor of nine different books, one of which is Church Planning Movements, which I think, Dr. Garrison, most of us have read, and numerous articles on topics related to reaching the world's least reached peoples through church multiplication movements. Dr. Garrison is an original, original member of the Table 71 group that has led to the formation of the Issachar Initiative and the Finishing the Task Coalition. In addition to his years of ministry, missionary service, Dr. Garrison was the Associate Vice President for Global Strategy, the International Mission Board, and Regional Director of the Southern Baptist, uh, Southern Baptist Missions in South Asia. He's also served as the Executive Director of Global Gates, an organization that reaches the ends of the earth through global gateway cities. And he's lectured in universities, seminaries, and churches in North America, South America, Europe, Africa, and Asia. And Dr. Garrison, when I was in seminary at Southwestern years ago, I had a missiology class. And in this missiology class, one of the textbooks was Church Planning Movements by you. And I recognized, uh, Dr. Garrison, two names in that book, David Watson and Victor John, because I'm from Lubbock, Texas, and so is David. And Victor often would come to Lubbock, and our, our church in Lubbock that I was a part of were, were mission partners with his organization. So I read the book in seminary, and it was amazing, but I don't even know if I could wrap my mind around it. And then about seven years later, as our church had uh, had been birthed and had grown, I read it again, kind of at our right before our 10-year mark, as we were praying about uh, the vision the Lord wanted us to have for the next 10. And when I read it the second time, I can just say the Holy Spirit used that book to totally change my life. And a lot of you guys know the quote that, that started it, that Dr. Kirsten put in his book, but I'll read it to you. And there were more like this in the book, but it was just transformative for me. And it's this idea of wig take. But the first, first time I saw it in the book when I was reading it the second time was in this quote. Uh, Dr. Garrison said, in the years that followed, Langston was joined by Calvin, Calvin and Margaret Fox. They were, these were missionaries, evidently. And it says, one sentence, together they planned what it would take to reach all of the kui, I'm not sure how to say that, with the gospel. And I was like, they planned to do what? <laughs> they were trying to reach all of them? How many are there? There must only be a hundred if they're going to reach all of them. And I look it up online, and I think there was over a million of them. And so he teased out this idea of wig take. I saw it throughout his book, and the Lord really used it in our church to cause us to begin to ask the question, what's it going to take to reach all the people in our region and to have a willingness to do whatever it would take to reach all the people in our region. So I've asked Dr. Garrison to come and share with us some today just his journey into movement. And then maybe even some about wig take and about these 10 universal elements that he says characterize every movement. So Dr. Garrison, we're so glad to have you. Thank you for coming and sharing with us today. Well, thank you, Chris. Uh, delighted to hear that someone else has gotten obsessed by that wig take question. It, uh, it was kind of floating around in the early days of, uh, well, it was CSI is what we called it. It was Cooperative Services International, that um, uh, innovative um, department at the International Mission Board that was charged with engaging the 1040 window and uh, finding ways to get residents in there was the initial vision. But because we, we caught this bigger question of what's it going to take to see all these people come to Christ, it really just, uh, first, it humbled us tremendously. Uh, as individuals, you know, who, who are we to think that God might use us to bring an entire people to faith in Jesus Christ? So it was very humbling. 
And if you've ever seen the logo, by the way, on the uh, wig take uh, image, the, the T is a guy on his knees with his hands up, looking up to God saying, Lord, what's it going to take? Because it's humbling. It also requires us to realize that I was a Southern Baptist uh, working with them, but this was far bigger than Southern Baptist. And uh, it was a God-sized uh, question, what's it going to take? And required God-sized resources. So it forced us as kind of narrow at the time Southern Baptist to say, look, there's a big body of Christ out there with, frankly, far more resources than than we can imagine to uh, to reach an unreached people group. So we began collaborating and partnering, you know, in concentric circles uh, from um, people who were just like us, people who were more conservative than us, people who were culturally more conservative, people from other nations, people who were more liberal than us, but wanted to see lost people come to Jesus. You know, it was kind of a whole gamut of, of possibilities. And we tried to keep the main thing the main thing, which was uh, initially our main thing was that every people on earth would have the right or the opportunity to hear and respond to the gospel. Some of you uh, older folks here may remember Bold Mission Thrust. That was the vision of the international, of really of Southern Baptist to take the gospel to every man, woman, and child on earth by the year 2000. Well, that was sort of our vision as well. But we found when we did take a wig take approach and say, what's going to take it to get the this people into the kingdom, it was a bigger question than just evangelism. It involved, uh, for us, seeing that first church planted. We wanted evangelism resulted in churches. And then when that first church was planted, our amazement to see God respond by saying, you know, I'll see your one and I'll double you. And the one becomes two and two becomes four and four becomes 16. And oftentimes, you know, with non-residential missionaries, missionaries who could not reside in these places, but they had projected the gospel into these places, working through partners, working through all kinds of means from, you know, today's satellite TV, internet broadcasts, diaspora ministries, relief ministries, tourism, sports evangelism, businesses mission. Uh, you know, it just goes on and on and on, the things that can be done, even if Americans are not welcome in a particular country. So uh, to quote our friend, uh, Rick Warren, who says, it's not about you. We had to realize as missionaries, it really wasn't about us. But if you ask the wig take question, it's really asking what's God gonna do and how can we be a part of that? How can we facilitate it, cast vision for it? Uh, do as John the Baptist said to uh, lower the hills and straighten the crooked roads and make straight the way uh, for the Lord to, to be seen and to come. So that became a big part of our, our ministry back in those days. That was in the late 80s. Uh, met a guy named Bill Smith, Bill and Susan Smith, who were the first strategy coordinators for a people group. We call them non-residential missionaries, abbreviated to NRM. Their critics call them not re really missionaries. That's what NRM stood for. So they took a lot of uh, shots and a lot of, um, you know, backhanded compliments. Actually, the guy that invented that term, not really missionaries, became one of those for us working with the Kurds in northern Iraq. So you kind of take all the criticisms with a grain of sand and recognize that if your heart's right, you're pointing in the right direction, you know, eventually people will understand and come along. And it's a thrill for me to see um, so many folks, 50, I think, or so participating in this conversation, God bless you, and I want to be of, of service to you in any way I can. Thanks, David. Would you tell us a little bit more about um, about wig take and how you discovered it? Because it sounds like as you interviewed a number of different missionaries, you started hearing that they were asking a similar question. So do you know who was who encouraging people to ask that question? Was it just the Lord leading different people? And so you discovered as you're researching this, hey, a lot of people are asking it, or where did this idea come from? And why do you think it's been so compelling? You gotta be careful, Chris, because I, I'm getting old now and uh, I can rattle on for a long time. So feel free to stop me. I've got strong views on where this thing started. And uh, in part, of course, it goes back to the Great Commission 
But when Southern Baptists, who were a very, you know, fairly provincial people group, always believed in missions, but, you know, we're the heart of America. When Southern Baptists embraced that vision of bold mission thrust, that every man, woman, and child would hear the gospel by the year 2000, uh, that, uh, that propelled us, compelled us as Southern Baptists to tenfold increase the number of missionaries, the mission giving, the number of church plants, the number of baptisms. But when uh, the president of the International Mission Board, or at the time Foreign Mission Board, Keith Parks invited David Barrett, this world Christian encyclopedist, to come and, and work out of the Richmond offices of the International Mission Board. Barrett, Barrett was monitoring everything. He'd been doing it for two decades. He had uh, a database he had built, even in the mid 1980s, or early 1980s, that had uh, you know, 14,700 people groups. And he was tracking the state of evangelization for every one of them. So he was asked to evaluate how Southern Baptists were doing in bold mission thrust. How are we doing? Keith Parks asked him, give us a report, a status report. You know, are we going to get there by the year 2000? This was around 1986, 87. And David Barrett uh, talked to me and said, you guys are doing better than anybody. In fact, better than anybody's ever done. You've put billions of dollars into fulfilling the Great Commission. The problem is, um, you're not going to come anywhere near reaching your goal. And everyone was kind of stunned. You know, they said, well, why? He said, well, because you're sending more and more missionaries to the same places. Uh, you're sending missionaries wherever missionaries can get a visa to reside as missionaries. So you're basically asking the question, what can we do to fulfill the Great Commission? And the answer was, we can send missionaries, more and more missionaries, but only to places that allow missionaries. So by limiting the question of what can we do to fulfill the Great Commission, we actually limited our outcome. And David Barrett was the one who came up with this idea. He said, you know, you got to do things differently. He said, there's no closed countries in the world. They're just closed to white Western missionaries in some cases. Uh, so you find out who are they open to, because the gospel is bigger than you. And I think for this, this created sort of an internal tension within the uh, uh, Foreign Mission Board, it was called at the time, uh, later International Mission Board. I'm just going to call it the IMB. Can I do that? Everybody know what I'm talking about? The IMB. So it created an internal crisis, an internal uh, conflict, uh, tension. And that's the best way when you have a vision that's a God-sized vision, and you honestly, brutally look at the facts and say, if I keep doing what I'm doing, Am I going to get to God's vision? And the answer for us uh, was clearly, no, we're not going to come anywhere near it. And that caused a paradigm shift. And that paradigm shift caused us to start looking at the whole world as, as our client. And Jesus came to seek, seek and to save that which was lost. And so we began to say, why do we exist? We don't exist because Southern Baptists want a missions program. We don't exist because because missionaries feel a calling and we need to support them. We exist because there's lost people in the world who need Jesus. They are our client. And we started refocusing ourselves away from where we were working. And, you know, the standard Baptist prayer was, uh, God is good. God is great. Let us thank him for our food. God bless the missionaries. Amen. And uh, we began to say, you know, it's really not about us. It's, it's about those people who have never yet heard. We became much more frontier focused. We started assigning missionaries to a particular ethno-linguistic people group, uh, like the the Kui people you mentioned there in Orissa State in India. And our missionaries, we said, your task is not to see what you can do. You, know, you may be in a, a gifted agriculturalist. Well, that's fine, but it's not about you. Yeah, but they need agriculture. Yeah, they need more than that. <laughs> they need agriculture and scripture and gospel and all these things in order to see them all come to Christ. So instead, let's step back for a moment and ask this question. What's it going to take? What's it going to take to see all of the Kui people come to faith in Jesus Christ? And when we started asking that question, what's it going to take? Suddenly, we're sort of lifted out of ourselves, and it's not about us anymore. It's about looking at what it takes for people to come to Christ. And for us, that was a comprehensive strategy built on certain pillars. Now, we say these are pillars not because they were handed down to us from God, you know, on a silver tablet or anything like that, but because every time someone asks the wig take question, 
they never got around these basic things. One was prayer. And I, 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 I challenge you, come up with a comprehensive wig take, what's it going to take strategy for your people, your community uh, without prayer. Well, of course, prayer was one that was in every strategy. Second one was evangelism. <laughs> You know, how will they come to faith if they don't hear the gospel? How are they going to hear the gospel unless there's evangelism? Well, what kind of evangelism? Well, there's lots of kinds of evangelism. So those are vehicles to get the gospel. There's only one gospel, but there's myriad ways to get it out there, and you adapt that to your situation. But we did know that every time there was a movement of God among these people, thousands of them were hearing the gospel every day. So how do you go from me an American who is famously monolingual, you know, we only speak one language. If we're lucky now, we speak a little Spanish. But here we're talking about a people that's hidden behind two or three languages that take years to learn. How can thousands of them hear the gospel every day? Well, once again, that, that yanks me out of my limitations and causes me to look at the world of resources. And I find out that, well, there's trans world radio, and there's Far East broadcasting, and there's Ibra and Al Hayat and other um, media who have whole teams that do translation work that can get the gospel to these people. So second thing in every strategy was evangelism. Third thing in every strategy was discipleship. And that discipleship leads to multiplying churches and, uh, and then uh, media ministry and uh, not uh, leadership development is usually a fifth element because it's, it's sort of like the four fields. You know, the leadership development goes back and uh, sows the seed that reproduces this cycle. But cutting across that, we would see mass media. Sometimes we would have a strategy for Jesus film or a strategy for uh, some sort of a broadcast so that thousands could hear the gospel in their own language. Cutting across it also would be ministry. And so we would use ministry uh, in prayer. We would pray for people and pray for their healing as we would do prayer walks through their area. We would listen to them so we could identify uh, needs that they have so that we could respond to those needs and in so doing get an opportunity to share the gospel. So ministry would cut across these pillars of, of uh, evangelism, prayer, evangelism. Uh, God's word was always an essential one of those pillars. Um, in fact, I may have skipped over that. I'm a little bit jet lagged, Chris. You have to bear with me. So I may have to go back and correct myself. God's word was always one of those pillars. And many times we were trying to reach a people group that were non-literate uh, or they were literate in one language, but their heart language was another. Well, we knew that if there was going to be any hope for a movement, somehow they had to have God's word in their language. And if it meant they couldn't read and write, then part of what we were talking about was maybe having a Jesus film or audio cassettes working with someone like Faith Comes By Hearing. And, and anyway, that was, our, that was our vision initially was just to uh, get God gospel, all these people in the Atlanta Beachhead Church. But when we saw these churches begin to multiply, it's as if God once again took us out of our limited perspective and said, watch what I'm going to do. And one of the verses Bill Smith uh, shared with me early on was Habakkuk 1.5, where God says, look to the nations, watch and be utterly amazed, for I'm going to do something in your day that you would not believe even if you were told. And we really saw that as being fulfilled as we began to see various places where church planning movements were emerging on Hainan Island in China, in Bihar State in northern India, the island of Cuba, uh, also down in Central America, uh, and of course among the Kui people. That was one of those in India. So uh, these movements began to change our perspective. And we began to, I wrote this little booklet back in say 1996, 97, called Church Planning Movements, which just looked at these movements and said, what are, what are in these movements? How do we reverse engineer it? Got a bunch of the missionaries together, the guys you mentioned, you know, David Watson, Curtis Sargent, Bill Smith, and others, and said, tell us what contributed to these movements. And as they began to tell us the various things they were doing, we just covered up a whiteboard with all of the things that they said they were doing. And then Watson stepped up and he's always a contrarian, you know, Watson steps up and he says, you know, for us, it wasn't what we did so much as what we stopped doing. So, oh, let's pull up another whiteboard. What did you stop doing or change that allowed a movement to break out? Rick Warren, again, used to say, you know, the question, 
church and how to build a great church is not always how do you build a great church. It's why is a great church not, not here? What are the impediments that need to be removed? And Chris, in some cases, it's a building itself. That's the impediment that keeps a great movement of God from unfolding. Anyway, all those things we're learning. Uh, I was filled up a whiteboard, took pictures of it or, or wrote it down. This is pre, pre-internet, I think a lot of this stuff. Was this pre-internet? Yeah. It's sad, isn't it? It's, that's how old we are. Uh, but went and wrote them up in a little 57-page booklet that later went into called Church Planning Movements. Went into over 40 languages. People just picked up, started translating it all over the world. We never paid for a translation. But they would usually write us and ask permission and say, in closed, you'll find a copy of the Mongolian translation or a copy of the, you know, Hausa translation from West Africa. So that was kind of fun. Anyway, that's how we, we kind of went into it. It was a problem-solving endeavor in many respects. The Great Commission is a problem to be solved. And um, it's not magic. It's got a lot of spiritual mystery in it and uh, amazing surprises. But we have a role to play, and our role is to get the gospel out and be faithful disciples and to plant healthy, reproducing churches. And, and then God promises that he'll be permeating that whole process, going before us, going with us, and following behind us. Hope that doesn't sound too humanistic. Yeah, that, I really don't mean for it to. It's powerful. No, thanks for sharing. So tell us a little bit more about some of those early movements. So you're, uh, Curtis Sargent was here, David, a few weeks ago talking about CSI and going out and um, with, uh, I guess David was also going out at that time. Bruce was going out at that time and he was telling about some of the early days and them going out kind of under the cover of the CSI and, uh, yeah. and Dr. Keith Parks giving them some freedom <laughs> to try some new approaches. Is, is those, as you started to hear about what was happening with David or Curtis or Bill or, you know, the different, what, what, what were you starting to hear and yeah, what what did you learn from it all? What what, yeah. what ultimately led to writing the book? Okay. Um, so the whole the whole approach to a comprehensive strategy for reaching a people group starts in 1987. Bill Smith, Susan Smith were our first uh, non residential missionaries. The next wave brought people like David Watson and. David and Jan and, and Mark and Cindy Morris and Curtis and Debbie Sargent, Bruce and Gloria Carlton. They were kind of in that next wave within the next five years. You know, within five years, we had about 100 of these folks working from North Korea, Mongolia, all the way across to the Fulani in West Africa. Um, we grew so fast that the International Mission Board said, look, we've either got to break up up this CSI experiment and let the various nine regional leaders assimilate these non-residential missionaries into their ranks, or we've got to take CSI and make it its own administrative region, the 10th region. You know, regions were like South America and West Africa and so forth. This would be the 10th. Big dispute. All the regional leaders uh, agreed that it should be broken up and assimilated into the uh, other regions. Um, but Keith Parks is very visionary, very bold, I believe. He said, no, we're going to make CSI its own administrative region. At that point, CSI faced a crisis. David Garrison's been directing this for the last uh, four and a half years. Uh, who should be the director now that it's an administrative region? This is a bigger thing. They chose my associate, Mike Stroop, to be the director, and I basically was left with no job at all. Um, everybody came up, you know, patted me on the back and said, you came in second, man. <laughs> and, uh, but what had been our world was suddenly dashed. And so what we did was, uh, we revisited our vision, which was to see the fulfillment of the Great Commission. We took one of those assignments and went to North Africa. Studied Arabic for the next three years, uh, focused on Libyan Arabs, but we were kind of off the grid because when you're in one of those highly restricted places, Everything's need to know. And suddenly I didn't know what was going on across this huge area that I'd previously directed. A few years later, I was invited to come back in the home office as the associate vice president for global strategy. And my job was to help all these regional leaders around the world develop their strategies. One thing I knew for sure, 
and that was that I had no competency to do that. So what I did instead is I looked at what was going on. We had about a thousand reports were coming in from mission fields all over the world. The research department was under my supervision. So I brought, had all those reports brought in and I would read through them and see how things were going. And you'd see this, you know, two churches started this year, four baptisms this year. Uh, we lost one church this year, three churches. And then you'd get one that says 300 churches started this year. You go, okay, this person is either illiterate or, or doesn't understand the question or they've got dinghy fever. Oh, and look, he's from Lubbock, Texas. That says a lot. So we set that one aside. <laughs> that we'll come back and visit those later. There's another one, you know, and there's maybe three or four anomalies out of that whole stack of a thousand. The anomalies were those that showed incredible growth. Well, those were Curtis Sargent's, you know, report and Bruce Carlton's report and David Watson's report. <clears throat> and we looked at them and we told them, said, guys, you know, nobody believes these numbers. You're in some of the toughest places in the world. How is this possible? <laughs> you know, Watson's full of holy helium sometimes and he can let go on you. But he said he bit his tongue and just said, come and see. So uh, we put together a research farm, put together a team of local experts and outsiders to go and do random samplings of this movement in the graveyard of missions that he said he thought had at least 50,000 new believers over the past four or five years. Well, they did an extensive assessment. This was in about 2001. When was this? This had to be earlier than that. Anyway, they did a big assessment of the movement and they came back and said, Watson was wrong. We think conservatively, it's not 50,000, it's at least 200,000 baptized believers. We think it's more likely closer to 600,000. And I found a similar thing with Hainan and with Cuba and with, with uh, uh, Cambodia. And that's when we realized this is something bigger than we've seen before. God is doing something here. And we need to learn from God. We need to learn from the body of Christ how to do the work of Christ. So I scribbled all this stuff together in a little booklet uh, um, uh, called Church Plenty Movements. It kind of took off from there. And uh, that sort of became a vision that people had. Uh, you know, 90% of our folks never get to church planning movements. But 100% of those who don't know anything about church planning movements don't care, are not looking for them. 100% of those don't get to church planning movements. So it's sort of like, what do you do? It's not a magic formula. Despite what critics say, we don't believe it's some sort of a mechanical thing that if you just do this and this and this, you'll get to this. But what we are is a learning community. This is the body of Christ, learning from the body of Christ, how to do the work of Christ. And there's been some brilliant practitioners along the way, people like uh, Bill and Susan Smith and uh, Curtis and Debbie Sargent and, and, and uh, the Carltons and uh, Jeff and Angie Sundell and you know Nathan and Carrie Shank. There's just John and Jenny Brady. I could go on and on and on. We're learning from each other, and they're learning from their national partners. What's it going to take to see all of your people come to Christ? And uh, and so it continues to compound and multiply. Does that make sense? Have I crammed too much in there? David, that makes so much sense. Thank you. And the history is just so is so helpful because at least of modern movements and seeing how, how they came about, what questions they were asking. And then, like you said in the book, so much of it was you just observing what God was doing, yeah. not prescribing. Yeah. Here's what a church well, planning movement is. Let's go try to start one. Right, David? It wasn't that like that. It's that's like, very important. Very important. You know, I, one of our strengths, Chris, was was my weakness and my ignorance. You know, I came in, I was working on a PhD at the University of Chicago. So I was this, this hot shot nerd from Chicago. You know, I'm an Arkansas guy. I grew up in Arkansas. Anyway, so, uh, but I came in and I had all this, you know, mission knowledge and enthusiasm. And by the grace of God, David Barrett took me under his wing. I was his associate for about a year and a half, really learned his research and data. And then uh, when they were looking for somebody who could direct this new initiative, I was the only one around who really knew all the different players in the pieces. So again, by the grace of God, uh, I was asked to be the director of the program. But most program directors at the International Mission Board are guys that have been around for 20, 30 years. They got at least a dozen years experience. And so 
they're put in that role because they're super competent. I was put in that role even though I wasn't super competent. I had never been a non-residential missionary. I'd never been a strategy coordinator. I'd never done all these things that God was birthing in our hearts. So what I did is I would arrange for us to have these, we call them iron on iron sessions, where we'd get the various, the new, new strategy coordinators sitting around in a table and one would share his or her ministry. Here's what's going on. Here's where we see God at work. Here's where I'm struggling. And then they would pull out their pencil and paper and they would say, help me. And the others would speak into their life and say, have you considered this? Or here's a great resource. Or we tried this. We had trouble and did this instead. It was successful. And they created these little learning communities, iron on iron learning communities. And so instead of looking to me as the guy that says, oh, yes, I think this is the wise way to go, you know, pad one or young one, you know, it, it, it was never a, an illusion of that. They, they knew that I didn't know what I was doing, but that the body of Christ would teach the body of Christ how to do the work of Christ. And under the authority of the word of God and the lordship of Jesus Christ, a little community of iron on iron is a powerful powerful administrative and learning tool because we would keep each other in check and move it forward and that's really how we got to movements it was people learning i mean brilliant in retrospect brilliant people at the time you know all novices various failures in their background a lot of opposition but boy god loves to take people who are malleable and open and humble and willing to say lord what's it going to take it's not about me if i need to be in the country i'll be in the country if I need to be out, I'll be out. But the bottom line is it's not about my getting resident somewhere. It's about seeing this entire people come to faith in Christ. And then I'd love to entertain any questions that anybody has too. So don't sure. uh, don't hesitate if I'm kicking up any questions in your own mind. This is great. Yeah, if you guys have questions uh, for David, if you just put them in the chat, we'll uh, scroll through those. David, I have a few more as, as we're waiting for some. Sure. Some in. Um, you talked in your book, and again, I think most people on this call will have, have read the book, Church Planning Movements. You've got some other great ones too, but certainly they've read that one. Uh, and you talk about, I don't know if you call them universal elements, but you call them elements that were in all of the CPMs that y'all were studying. I think you, you named some of them earlier, but I guess my question is, what are the elements that in your mind continue to be uh, prevalent as you're looking at church planning movements around the world that you're just saying to a group of Western leaders, David, mostly that are saying, we want to see movements. We're willing to do what it takes. What are some of those universal elements or some of the things, the principles you would tell us are just non-negotiable in our pursuit of movement in the, in, in the West? And some of us are not in the West, but I would say majority are. Oh, uh, you know, I, I had almost forgotten that you told me I was going to need to remember to go through those 10 universal elements. I was trying to say, can I still remember those? One of our regional leaders down in Central America actually came up with a song with hand motions to make them remember these 10 things. Uh, you know, they're sort of, um, they're really not rocket science. You know, those 10 things, they're just sort of goads that push you back to say, now, why do you think I sent you as a missionary? It wasn't just so you could learn the language well. It wasn't just so you'd have a great cross-cultural experience or make a lot of friends. You know, it's really about seeing these people come to Christ. You are a means to that end. But what we did in these movements, you know, we tried to identify what are the elements that we see in every one of these. Well, there was always extraordinary prayer. Um, you know, that's and that hasn't changed. Our understanding of prayer has changed. You know, when I first went out, I had this extraordinary prayer. We'd seen it. So I got all the women's missionary unions across the country to pray for me and my people group and my family. And I put out, I think, 14 newsletters the first year I was trying to reach Libyans. Uh, turns out that's not really the kind of prayer that we were seeing in these movements. As we dug into them, what we were seeing was prayer being almost a response to every situation they faced. You see someone with a need, first thing you do is you pray for them. You meet a stranger, you become friends, you say, hey, hey, our family's a family prayer. How can we pray for you? And suddenly you've got a spiritual connection. Prayer was kind of like the atmosphere that flowed through these movements, not just something that someone was doing back in Birmingham or in, in Austin, Texas. Or so. Although that was fine and good and helpful, unless it got into the DNA of the movement itself, it was, uh, 
it was not the kind of prayer we were seeing in movements. So uh, extraordinary, I think abundant, abundant evangelism, we call it. I have to apologize for the adjectives I use. I didn't know what to call it. There was tons of evangelism going on in these people groups, sometimes like in a T for T setting, it was word of mouth. Sometimes in a DMM DBS setting, it was going through all these little uh, small Bible study discovery groups that were happening. Sometimes like in Algeria, it was coming in through satellite broadcast. You know, it was Joyce Myers and Abuna Zachariah and uh, Charles Stanley in translation speaking good Arabic, you know, coming into uh, North Africa. It was just different in different places. But the bottom line was the gospel was being communicated. And in the most rapidly multiplying, which was really the T for T model, it was viral. It was mouth to ear. A lot of sharing the gospel. Jesus film permeated all of these, not all these, so many of these movements. But it, that's evangelism. Uh, what else do we see? Well, the word of God was the authority. And that was important because, frankly, historically, when our men are out to the field, they would evangelize, disciple, plant the first church, pastor the first church, and lead the first church sometimes for the first two decades until they felt that the people were competent to shepherd the church themselves. In movements, what we saw was people uh, more often, uh, the missionaries saying, what does God's word say? Even when they knew the answer, even though they were well-trained, they would try to drive the new believers and new disciples into God's word for their authority. They would discuss it together and the community would discuss it together. So there was feedback, it wasn't unilateral, but it was more vertical. Vertical. It was between the new believer and God through his word, rather than a triangle going from God to the missionary and then to the new believer. And that allowed for this multiplication. And we saw that widely in these movements, that uh, there was a reliance on the authority of God's word. Of course, um, lay leadership, we found that it's perfectly biblical to have paid leaders but you immediately limit your multiplicative potential, your ability to multiply when you start putting money into paying leaders because there's not enough money, <laughs> frankly. It slows it down. And every time a, a leader thinks he's gonna raise up a new leader and his piece of the pie is gonna be cut thinner so that he can fund that new leader, then you've got actually a de-incentive or a disincentive to a multiplication. Uh, likewise, uh, local leadership, even if a person was a lay person, if he wasn't one of the people, he was an outsider. Uh, it didn't matter if he may be an Indian citizen, but if he's an Indian citizen from one people group and tribe working with another, he's an outsider. And movements were built on uh, indigenous multiplication. Meeting in homes, I think we continue to see that as being pretty normative, although homes are sometimes redefined around the world. We have people meeting in coffee shops and in parks and then just like they used to meet in the catacombs in the early days they meet wherever they can is the bottom line they don't wait for a building um what else do we have in that was missionary suffered one of those uh 10 elements i don't remember if that was a common or a, I, th I think that was just a common characteristic but one of the things we found was if you really do get involved in a movement well satan's going to come after you and he will he will throw all kinds of, of uh, distractions and uh, uh, landmines in your path. And so if you, if you recognize it and you stay prayed up and you keep accountable and you keep humble and uh, keep thankful, then you don't uh, die the death of a righteous indignation or a moral failure or some of those things that can keep you going. So uh, there was that healthy churches was one of the universal elements. And uh, that was an interesting challenge because back then in the, in the late 80s, early 90s, no one asked about um, what is a, a healthy church? What is a definition of a church? A church was whatever a church called itself. Today, everybody's trying to fine tune these, oh, you're not really a church. You're not really a church. So let me tell you, a church at its essence is a community continuing what Jesus began 2,000 years ago. And part of that means obeying him. It means believing in him, trusting him, but perpetuating the kind of life that Jesus lived. So we found these five things, and I'm indebted again. I've mentioned now the third time, Rick Warren. I'm really not a member of his church, but I found things that were helpful there. One of the tools that he gave us was if we look at the great teachings of Jesus, the great commandment, the great commission, from the great commandment, we get three purposes for a church. 
great commandment says, love uh, God with all your heart. He says, that's worship. He says, love your neighbor as yourself. If your neighbor is a Christian, that's fellowship. If your neighbor is lost, that's ministry. So the first three purposes come out of the Great Commission. Love God with all your heart. Love your neighbor as yourself. Worship, fellowship, ministry. And then from the Great Commission, we get make disciples, discipleship, teaching them to observe everything I've commanded you or to obey everything I've commanded you. And then baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost, and among all nations. So that's kind of an evangelism mission hybrid there. It's evangelism if it's right next door. It's mission if it goes cross-cultural. But those five purposes became the, uh, the standard by which we said, is this a healthy church? So when we looked at these movements, we didn't know what we would find. Are they balanced? Are they healthy? And what we found was, yeah, that was very much. These were characterized by these five elements. One guy, he said to us, he says, now ministry in the West, when you talk about ministry, you're talking about doing nice things for people. Over here, it's more like casting out demons and raising the dead and healing the sick. Does that count? We said, well, I guess we'll let it pass. You know, so. <laughs> so yeah so those universal elements honestly i haven't seen them change they're so broad and they were intentionally broad you know that uh i just can't imagine a movement without lay leadership and local leadership and intentionally planning reproducing churches sometimes you plant a church that just can't reproduce easily it may be a great church in every other way but it's just encumbered by the uh the weight of what's on its uh, on its uh frame and by meeting in homes and have dynamic structures, very uh, reproducible, then you've got the components that allow a movement to take place. Uh, I've had guys over the years who have said, you know, we all want to see a church playing movement here. But if you examine what they're doing, well, they're trying to raise money to build a building. And they've got a staff they're wanting to raise support for. And they're putting a cart in front of the horse uh, and they'll never get to movement that way. It's not to say they're they're bad or wrong. It's just, as they say in Arkansas, that dog won't hunt. <laughs> you can translate that for all these urbanites from the sophisticated great, Lubbock people. David, I wanted to ask you about uh, a ministry you were recently um, I- involved with, and that is uh, Global Gates, because there's quite a few people, David, on this call that are in kind of global gateway cities. And my Mm -hmm. wife and I recently in the last few years, I'm not sure if Stan had told you, but we moved to Dallas, Fort Worth, primarily to work with Thai and Lao immigrants, partly inspired by the vision that Global Gates has been, you know, sharing over the last number of years. So I guess, uh, can you talk a little bit more for those that may not even be familiar with that as to how you see global gateway cities being instrumental in seeing movements among unreached people groups? Yeah. Um, in a real sense, every one of our Global Gates missionaries, we train to be a strategy coordinator. They are basically a non-residential missionary to a global people group that happens to be scattered all over the world and happens to also be here in the West. So we've tried to say to them, you know, you can create a ministry to your people group. No doubt they've got tons of ministry needs, but that's short-sighted. Uh, what would it take instead of putting a Band-Aid on a need, you know, if if you revitalized that whole patient and they became partners with you in multiplying new life throughout their community. So uh, we trained our, our Global Gates missionaries to look at a people group, for example, the uh, 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 Punjabi Sikhs in, uh, in New York City. So New York City is not the end of your vision. The end of your vision is all the Punjabi Sikhs everywhere. They're staying connected. So let's see if we can get the gospel into those connections and see if we can see a multiplying movement of Punjabi Sikhs coming to Christ around the world. And uh, so now you start looking at your people group as almost like a a little gift God's given you. Try out your ministry here, do it here. And if it really does well, it may spread through this group to the huge uh, Punjabi Sikh populations in Toronto and Vancouver and, of course, in the Punjab. So... um, that's the thinking. Uh, global Gates' uh, vision is to reach the ends of the earth through global gateway cities. And it's, you know, we didn't expect this to happen. I think um, some of our frontier missionaries with Southern Baptists and other groups had to come back to the U.S. Uh, for health reasons 
or one of their kids had some learning disabilities or something brought them back. But rather than just go home, they found that there were tens of thousands of their people group living in Queens, New York, or living in the Bronx, or living in Dallas, Fort Worth, uh, or living in Houston. My goodness, they're all down there. Um, and so these missionaries, they got first world help for their kids or for their health, but they plugged themselves in intentionally into an unreached people group and found very quickly that the new paradigm today is that these immigrants aren't just coming from the ends of the earth, burning their bridges behind them. They're coming here with pipeways of communication and interrelationship back to the homelands from which they come. And oftentimes, you know, you walk through a, a neighborhood in, in, in the Queens or in Brooklyn where there's Yemenis. There'll be a whole neighborhood. Everybody's speaking Yemeni Arabic and they're talking on their phone to their family back in Sana. And there's just this continual stream of information, connection, relationships. So we said, my goodness, it's as if God says, look, if you guys aren't willing to go to the ends of the earth, I'll bring them to you. And through these windows and opportunities, you can be part of a global ministry. Because one of the first things we train our folks to do is find out who's working among your people group overseas. And so all these connections start coming together. And there's a synergy as the body of Christ cooperates with the body of Christ globally to do the work of Christ and fulfill in the Great Commission. <laughs> I, just, I just love I get that. excited about that. Uh, David, I love that. There. I love that vision. And, you know, especially those that are on this call that are uh, pursuing the multiplication of disciples in churches, you can't help but when you're in San Diego or Portland or Dallas, Fort Worth or New York to run into some of these people. <laughs> and yeah. So I yeah. think a lot of us are trying to be more intentional with the people that the Lord has brought from the nations that are unreached around us, in addition to whatever else we may be doing, really also focusing on what can we catalyze here as well. Hey, David, there's another David on the Absolutely. call, and uh, he has a question for you. And this uh, David is a pastor, mm -hmm. and his question for you is, would you talk about CPMs in the West, like the U.S. or Europe? What progress are you seeing, and what unique challenges do you see, he asked? Uh, you know, there's a few things. Um, uh, it's, it's, it's always tempting to start with the challenges. You know, one of the challenges, we kind of bunch of uh, uh, ecclesiological uh, purists who believe there's only one way to do church. And if you do it different in that way, then you're, uh, I think the word they used was insidious. <laughs> so any owner who's not doing a church, their styles in cities. It's always painful when you're here and there's so many other churches rather than encouraging, supporting the Chuck and Rocks at you, because we all like to be liked. But that's just a reality. We've got some, some folks in the Nine Marks Network, you know, not to mention any names, but who are very prescriptive about what it's got to look like. And they're brilliant folks. They're good, godly people. I think, I think very highly of them. I wish they quit throwing rocks at us and, and at people that are seeing movements. But we can learn from them. You know, there's things we can learn. We're all in this together. Uh, so that's one of the challenges here. Another challenge we have is that we don't do church planning movements well in the West because we don't have to. Uh, that's one of the real challenges. People have choices here. And in many of these restricted countries, you know, where Christianity is so uh, uh, persecuted or at least oppressed, um, for someone to be identified with a church and a church building across is just uh, putting a big target on them. And so there's a lot of disincentives in non-Christian, anti-Christian societies to, to identifying in a corporate way with a church building. Meeting in homes allows you in some ways to virally uh go around that barrier and here in the west and we got some nice church buildings we got some great staff you know well-trained wonderful facilities and ironically our very strength in some ways is our weakness and so when people do come to christ you know they look around and say well i could start a house church in my home or i could go to that church and just sit on my kingdom assets and and be fed every day and, you know, and just be happy and have all the nice resources. So honestly, that's a big challenge is that people are going to have uh, the freedom to choose. And it's always easier to not do what people like Chris Galano says done. Am I saying your name right, Chris? Yeah. I mean, yeah. that's a, that's a courageous step and it's an uphill battle simply because um, 
you know, when push comes to shove, especially new people in a country, the immigrants, they're working two or three jobs and they could maybe make it in to sit in for a service or they could do house church. Uh, they almost have to see the value of the house church. And uh, that's that's kind of incumbent on us to make it make it really the body of Christ for them, something that they wouldn't dare miss because they'd be missing life itself. Now, examples, I think that was one of the questions over here. Examples of uh, church planning movements in the West. You know, I, I tell people this, and this is in my bigger church planning movements book, is the whole uh, 18th and 19th century was a history of church planning movements in the West. I mean, <laughs> uh, the, whole, the whole congregationalization of, uh, of North America in every county, every county seat town, there's a church planted uh, across the 19th century. That's a miracle. And that's because you had lay led uh, massive evangelism, dependence on the word of God, abundant evangelism, prayer, and that sort of thing were going on. But as we became institutionalized and we started professionalizing, you know, we got a higher quality of preaching and teaching. And we started coalescing around that. And with that, Ying Kai used to say, when you name someone a pastor, everyone else sits down. <laughs> and I think in the 19th century, everyone, every lay person stood up, took action. I remember my dad telling me his dad built a little one-room church building down by the creek. And once a month, a guy would come through and preach. You know, that was a beginning of a transition from house-led stuff into uh, what they thought was God-honoring, which was to have a building. And it's not that it can't be, but I think uh, it, it becomes a challenge unless the church building institution has a, a movement a vision. In India, some of them do. I talked to a guy, uh, his name is a Pastor Mohan. When I got to India in 2002, he was uh, introduced as pastor of the largest church in India. I think he had 40,000 members. He was in uh, Chennai, Madras. And uh, we were all talking about movements, you know, it was kind of a growing thing. Came back about 10 years later and he said, yeah, I said, we we came to realize that movements was the way. So we've added 5,000 house churches to our 40,000 member congregation. Still had the institutional church, but they realized that to get into places so that people didn't have to come miles and miles to your church, that the wineskin of house church was more conducive to these, um, to many eco socioeconomic uh, communities. And really that's the way it is in America today, guys. You know, we're not really growing the church as much as we're swapping sheep from church to church. There's a whole lot of migrating going on. I'm here in the Colorado Springs area. And, you know, people will go from preacher to preacher, fellowship to fellowship, uh, ministry to ministry. But in terms of reaching the lost, it's not as winsome to the lost. Uh, you've got to go to them, take the gospel of them and house churches getting into their homes. Uh, means it's immediately indigenous and contextualized. It's immediately in their language and it's lay led. It's immediately reproducible, but there's no money in it. I mean, that's the that's the ecclesionomic reality of church planting movements in the West. The traditional church model in the West is is a. It's not that it's lucrative. I'm not saying people are making a fortune off this. Most pastors are not. Very few are. But it works. It's an economically viable uh, model that you grow your church and they tithe and it supports the building, the staff and the programs so that you can grow the church. And they tithe and it supports. And it's a kind of a, you know, it's a, they're all interrelated. In church planting movements, you're planting these house churches. And if they tithe uh, to the church, they're giving, in our case, our house church used to, Choose five things we would give to, only five things. We would give to something related to worship or to fellowship or to ministry or to discipleship or to evangelism and mission. Recognize those five things. Come right out of the great comm commandment, the great commission, the five purposes of a church. And we always had enough money to do whatever God laid on our heart in any one of those areas. And it was dynamic. Um, but if you've got a building and you've got paid staff, then You've got to add a six finger at least, pay for the staff, a seven finger, pay for the facilities. And uh, economically, it ends up working against a movement. So 
uh, it's kind of complicated, but it's kind of clear at the same time why we don't see more movements here in the West. David, that's so good. No, that's so, so helpful. If we can, I have two more questions. I'll kind of put them together and then we'll send everybody off to their breakout groups to discuss this further. But what, what David, right now, would you say you're just excited about in the world of movements? Not all of us are well connected to movements worldwide to really know what's going on. So what's exciting? And then maybe what's a final word to encourage those of us on this call, all of us wanting to see movement, some of us just getting started. Some of us, David, have some first generation churches. Some of us have some second generation churches. None of us quite to multiple streams of fourth gen yet. Would love you, you just to in encourage us uh, as, as we close out the time. Um, you know, I've been working with Global Gates the last, uh, I'm retired, Sonia and I retired uh, the end of December this last year. We pushed movements movements training movements methods movement ideals among all of our people groups for uh, the entire seven years that i was the uh executive director and really for a couple of years before that before i got there and we've not seen movements yet so the, i'm going to begin with that confession to tell you that you know we want it desperately now we're beginning to see it at global gates with the bengalis the Bangladeshi work. And there's a million reasons why Bangladeshis won't come to Christ, including the fact that they're working 20 out of 24 hours every day. They just don't have time. But what, we've just been relentless in this, you know, what's it going to take? We know God doesn't want any of them to perish. What, what's going to happen? And we got a real clue from media to movements, which is a ministry that started actually in, in Tunisia of all places with a team expansion team. It's now gone all over the world. And it involves broad sowing of a message, just a friendly message that leads to another message that leads to eventually, would you like to know more about Jesus, the Jesus film gospel, and then on into discipleship and church formation. We didn't think we needed that in America because, you know, all these Bangladeshis, we know where they are. There's 100,000 of them in New York City, but they're all working. They're all busy. But when they go home, they flip on their social media in their language and they look and see what messages there are for them and so we began to say what if we get into that flow and we find out where the holy spirit's at work and you start getting a response here and there and you see that there are people out there and i, I share this with my reformed calvinist brothers and sisters there is an element of predestination that there are the elect and i'm not saying that god doesn't want everybody to come to christ but he begins with an elect in each community and finding that elect for us meant broad sowing through social media finding them then honing in on them to be able to uh, disciple them nurture them cast vision and co-labor with them to see it multiply out and we're beginning to see that so even our guys who are top-notch cpm practitioners i think of kevin and holly greason down the houston area they've had little fruit in houston but the relationships there have led them back to places like um, uh, Chittagong in southern Bangladesh, where they worked with the Rohingya and seen hundreds of Rohingya Muslims come to faith in Christ. And our missionaries were doing the very thing they were doing in Houston, seeing very little fruit, but taking those same approaches to Bangladesh among these Rohingya refugees they saw a lot. So I guess kind of what I'm saying here, guys, is it is an adventure and a journey. It helps if you know how the story ends. And the story ends with Jesus winning and Christ being all in all and the glory of God, the knowledge of the glory of God, which is Christ in you, the only hope of glory, the knowledge of the glory of the Lord covering the earth as the waters cover the sea. So knowing that to be the case, every place you are, we know what God desires. Everything else is simply a matter of uh, problems to solve, challenges to overcome. And it's not about you. It's about the body of Christ. But your role, God's called you to that particular calling for a purpose. And maybe it's to find that person who will break through and be the next Apostle Paul or, or to help them get a new understanding of what church can be, that it's not bound by bricks and mortar, but it's really bound by the, the community of Christ under the Spirit of God, adhering to the Word of God. So my, my prayer for you is may your fruit increase. May God bless and multiply you. And uh, 
it doesn't yet appear what it's going to be like at the end of the day. I don't know what God's going to do here, but we know that he doesn't desire that any would perish. So you're in the good work. God bless you. If I can help in any way, uh, don't hesitate to, uh, to ask. Amen. Would you guys help me thank uh, Dr. Garrison for coming and sharing with us today?